Welcome to Adoption Roundtable, a place to encounter the latest adoption research, policy, and practice in an accessible way. This is a space for adoptees, adoptive families, birth families, and adoption professionals. I'm Dr. Emily Helder, a clinical psychologist, researcher, and professor at Calvin University. I am also the co-editor of the Rutledge Handbook of Adoption, along with Dr. Alicia Marr and Dr. Gretchen Robel. In season one of Adoption Roundtable, we'll be having conversations with the authors of chapters in the Handbook of Adoption. They are top international scholars in a diversity of fields, and together we'll talk about their work and what it means for understanding adoption. So hello, I'm Dr. Emily Helder, and I'm here with Sibilu Boja and Christy Gleason. Uh, Sibilu, you are the Director of Africa Programs at Bethany Christian, and uh, Christy, you're the VP of Global Services at Bethany Christian. So um, you are also both the co-authors of a chapter in the Rutledge Handbook of Adoption on the development of the domestic adoption system in Ethiopia and the roles that um, that you've played in that and Bethany has played in that. Uh, so yeah, why don't we start and Sibilu, you can start. Will you tell us a bit about your current role, the, the components of your current role and kind of what drew you to that role? I have been with Bethany for the last 10 years now. So the first five years were, um, Primarily my involvement with the Ethiopia program, I was the country director. So I was um, heavily involved in, in uh, developing programs for the Ethiopia office. Uh, pretty much what we do in the rest of Africa and I guess around the world. Uh, but then the last five years have been um, working more closely with all of our Africa programs. Um, so which, um, in which way we have offices in countries such as Ghana um, and Ethiopia, but also where we work through partners in countries such as South Africa, uh, Uganda, and, and, and Zambia. So my role is to help our uh, country offices and partners in, in program design, implementation, and, and some organizational issues when it comes to supervision and ensuring um, um, commitment to best practices when it comes to implementation of programs. Mm -hmm. um, I also work closely with our country directors and, and helping them with uh, growth and, and management of existing programs. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you so much. And Christy, can you go? Sure. So as VP of Global Programs, I see all of the programs and all the service lines we have around the world. Um, so besides intercountry adoption and domestic adoption that we'll be talking about more today, we also have programs that serve to keep families together, so family preservation and strengthening. We have um, humanitarian response, and re um, in Ethiopia, we are working in some of the refugee camps in southwest Ethiopia, and so we also have some refugee services that we do. Uh, so I've also been with Bethany for almost 10 years um, and so was really excited to come on board and, and join the team. I really liked the, um, the mix of both the domestic U.S. work, but then also the ability to help build and support programs around the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's so great. I think the programs that you have for Bethany, both in a number of countries in Africa and around the world, are really unique and exciting. Yeah, that's why we were kind of excited to have you guys write the chapter. Uh, so, so the chapter really outlines a lot of the movement um, toward this development of the domestic adoption system in Ethiopia that you've been a part of, um, and and making it a more formalized, you know, process based on best practices. So, Sabilu, so will you give us a bit of a outline about what are the current options available for kids in Ethiopia in particular that aren't able to be cared for within their biological family? Yeah, so it, Ethiopia is, is a signatory to the uh, Convention on the Right of the Child and, and other conventions um, and, and international instruments for best practices when it comes to alternative care. So our, I would say our policies to a large extent align with what is globally accepted as, as best practice. Um, so in Ethiopia, 
the major, the overarching policy instrument is what we call the alternative care guideline. Um, I would say something that is to a large extent adopted from the UN guidelines on, on alternative care. Um, so it um, gives priority to um, local options. Uh, here in Ethiopia, we call them um, community-based options. And, and more specifically, I would say kinship care is kind of the, the, the first priority uh, where kids are um, encouraged to be with extended family member, um, but in a more, more in, a, in a, an informal way. Um, not going through the court process or any formal placement where there is also accountability on the caretaker, but something that uh, is widely practiced, I guess, across the developing world. Um, so that's the first care option. And next is foster care. Um, and foster care, as it is conventionally understood to be a temporary form of care here in Ethiopia, but it takes different variants. And we, Bethany Christian Services, are, I would say, the, the, the ones that introduced formal foster care, although they were kind of attempts to, to do that in a more informal way al alongside kinship care. Um, but government also promotes foster care. And, and then comes domestic adoption, um, along with international adoption. Um, there was lack of clarity which takes kind of the first, um, uh, you know, precedence. But for some reason, when we had been practicing international adoption, international ado adoption was widely preferred um, uh, than uh, domestic adoption. So that has been the case until we international adoption was banned in 2007. And finally, is the, it, it's the institutional care, which is basically uh, care of children in, in orphanages. And uh, that has been clearly discouraged and is considered a measure of last resort. But, um, you know, I, I think I would say we, we don't see what's on paper on, on, on in practice. So looks really good <laughs> on paper. And I, I think it kind of provides the the thinking and the intent of, of the government and what needs to be um, happening when, you know, to, to serve the best interest of children. But in practice, um, we don't necessarily see the implementation of uh, services along these priorities. So in, in the past, and as it has, it has been highlighted in, in the uh, article, um, international adoption and institutional care where, um, I would say the widely used service lines uh, and the other domestic services were kind of uh, lagging behind. And this seems to be kind of what you're targeting in your work is to really make that shift, make the make the um, paper what's on paper, you know, an actual exactly. reality. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. And 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 so the Ethiopian government was to a large extent promoting that. Uh, but not necessarily having the means, mm -hmm. the expertise, and the tools to do that. And Bethany is actually what, that, that's the gap we saw and we, we tried to work, provide hand both to the government and other like-minded organizations who were really seeking to see that happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Christy, so um, on the U.S. side of things, a lot of U.S. agencies have either um, reduced the size of or, or eliminated their international adoption program. So um, from the U.S. side, I'd love to hear your thoughts on, um, on the kind of things that are leading to though, that change in, in the system here in the U.S. Yeah, there's been there's been a huge decline in the number of intercountry adoptions. I think everyone's probably aware of that. Um, I I think that Bethany Christian Services has maybe a little bit of a different perspective on why that is. So I hear a lot that um, intercountry adoption numbers are down because there's just not the number of children available. Um, I don't think that that's true. There's still thousands and thousands and thousands of children around the world that are available for intercountry adoption that are cleared, 
Um, but these children are different than they were 10, 15, 20 years ago, right? So these are older children, children with significant special placement needs, children with significant medical needs, children that are um, quite a bit more difficult to find a family for. And so those children are still available. They're still there. They're still, most of them are still in orphanage care, institutional care. And so um, that, that change in the population of children that are available for intercountry adoption doesn't really meet what Americans are looking to adopt in, in general. There are lots of wonderful families that are looking to adopt older children and children with special placement needs. So I'm not saying that it doesn't, ha that it doesn't happen, um, but really Americans are still looking to adopt very young children uh, as healthy as possible. And so there's that mismatch, right? And so the numbers have really, really plummeted. Um, Bethany sort of had this aha moment, maybe probably 10 years ago, as we started to see the numbers to decline, I think part of it is because of uh, the rule that Ethiopia, the government of Ethiopia had instituted um, where adoption agencies had, if they were going to have a license to do intercountry adoption in Ethiopia, they also needed to invest in doing some social services work in country in Ethiopia. So as we had that opportunity to do more, Bethany saw um, this this gap that Sibili, Sibili was just talking about of children that are outside of family care um, not going to be placed through intercountry adoption. And so really looking to find alternative community-based um, options for them in Ethiopia. And so we've just kind of started like building towards that, building towards that. And then a couple years ago, well, probably more like four or five years ago now, the tipping point kind of pushed us over the edge to really wanting to focus on the domestic options for children. One, it's in, it's also, um, in very much alignment with the Hague Convention where those local options are the first and the priority. And, and, and so we, we started seeing this ability to place children in Ethiopia, in Ethiopian families. And, and we started thinking, why, why wouldn't we do that? That makes the most sense. It's in line with international standards. It's better for children. And so really sort of have been shifting. And then now with the um, closure of intercountry adoption in Ethiopia a couple of years ago, um, it all it all very much kind of came together that that would be our, our priority and our focus. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So I want to go back to you, Sibilu. So one of the things I thought was really interesting as I was, you know, editing the chapter, working on it with you was the section that you wrote about um, informal adoption practices that were happening in Ethiopia for for quite some time and and that um, yeah, that that formed the framework around which you could build some of the more formal legal options. So yeah, I'd love to hear from you a bit about how you thought through using that pre-existing framework to make a kind of culturally sensitive adoption process there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, in as much as I like, you know, culture to be, the importance of being culturally sensitive, I, I also, see that not everything that we find in culture is necessarily useful and, and, and serves the best interest of the child. So Bethany has been very aware of that right from the beginning. When we began, we, we were fortunate enough to have a local word for adoption. Um, not all cultures have that um, as a you know, pre-existing practice. So we had a word for that. We didn't have a word for foster care, but we had a word for adoption. And um, and when, when with that word comes, you know, all the, the cultural practices and values and norms attached. Um, so we really try to tap into that um, where where we think it's it's um, it aligns with best practices, but also kind of try to be very careful about how we use cultural pro practices in promoting family-based care that meets standards of best practice. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we, we took it both ways. So in, in situations where it allows us to have, a, you know, helps us with the welfare of the child or protects the child's um, uh, welfare better, then we, we kind of reinforce that through even more scientific evidences and, and kind of reaffirm to the community that this is a good practice to build on. Uh, but in other situations where we found uh, that the practices don't necessarily serve the best interests of the child, we were also 
open to kind of not really highly criticize it, but just create the awareness to the community to make sure that they are aware that those practices not, don't necessarily help the child. So with uh, um, Gudifecha, which is the local uh, term we use here in Ethiopia, in, in some communities there are practices, you know, there are different variants of um, Gudifecha and in some cultures they um, families that have more children would give one of their child to a family that can't have a child. Um, in as much as this is a good gesture and, you know, kind of maybe helps, you know, the community to build that sense of, um, you know, solidarity with this family that couldn't have a, a child, but that's not necessarily good for, for the child, that specific child who has been handed over to another family. Um, and so we, we kind of try to discourage that uh, and, and by teaching them about, you know, what it means for the child to be raised by biological uh, parents and, and uh, how that's the best interest of the child should be our primary concern and based on which we make every decision about the child. Um, so that, that has been kind of, that will continue to be also an, a, an ongoing work but in, in, in the same community, there is also a very elaborate uh, culture of officiating um, and, and the, the placement of the child into this new family. So we, we do have our standard formal placement ceremonies, but in, in those cultures, we, try, we tend to use that cultural placement ceremony because it, um, it introduces the child to the entire community, not just to that family, new family, but to the whole community. And that, from that moment on, the entire community would regard that child as their own and belonging to this new family. So that, that's good for the child and, and, and good for the community. And we have had problems with some parents having difficulties even sharing, you know, that the child has been adopted because, you know, because of sensitivities around um, reaction from extended family members or the larger community, but being part of such ceremonies kind of, you know, solves that problem. And 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 so we've been promoting that. Um, so it it kind of requires you to be very careful about which you know service, which cultural practices to use and not to use. But and we've been very careful and selective about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I would think that being having so many staff that are in Ethiopia, you know, lived there all their lives, that your ability then to be able to see that culture and know the best practices and be able to weave those two things together really results yeah. in be best outcomes for kids. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, another thing that's in the chapter is a discussion of some of the uh, laws, policies that have been play in place, and we've talked about these a little bit already so far. Um, one thing I was curious about was, you know, how you've seen some of those po those written policies uh, impact on the ground direct practice changes that you've made. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm just curious how much of the policies were already in place and you're just, uh, you know, you're working to make the direct practice kind of align with the policies or are there policy or law changes that you think still need to be made um, in Ethiopia to try to align with the direct practice that you're aiming for? That's a very good question. So uh, in, in if specifically speaking about Ethiopia, we, I would say our policies kind of lag behind practice. Uh, and that's what we discovered, at least from, from what we've been trying to do in Ethiopia for many years now. Um, we have the kind of the generic framework for family-based care, as I described earlier, but not necessarily the details when it comes to um, you know, standards of practice and, and, and regulation across different regions, and especially in Ethiopia, where we have a, a federal um, kind of government arrangement where each region or state have their own autonomy in terms of making 
um, policies, it's been kind of very regular and inconsistent around the country. So with our practice, and we're currently active in three regions, we're trying to create that, that base for best practice for which then policymakers can say, okay, what is lacking in our policies? What are the gaps? Um, and, and we've been feeding into that. Um, so that's the situation in, in Ethiopia. But if you look at other African countries, for instance, Ghana, I think they've kind of way ahead in terms of having clear policies um, and laws and, and, and guidelines, but kind of lagging in the, on the practice side. Um, or Zambia would be a, another example for that. But South Africa is where you see kind of that balance between good policies and kind of you know, a long tradition of um, formal um, family-based care practices. Although there is kind of inequality between the different um, people groups in, in South Africa for, for reasons that we all know. So that, that, that um, is kind of my assessment, but now with our program, uh, especially now we are currently implementing a US, US aid funded uh, project where we are trying to address that. So after having identified the gaps in policy and laws, we are kind of working upwards now, um, helping policymakers address those gaps. We have an active project currently that is um, that has brought together almost 15 major child welfare organizations, um, such as UNICEF, Save the Children, Plan International, uh, where we are working closely with the government of Ethiopia to put in place uh, a directive for alternative care. We have a guideline, but you know, guidelines are guidelines, kind of they're not enforceable, they're not legally binding. So we are kind of, we, we're building a directive now and, and uh, a team of uh, uh, five subgroups are currently working on that uh, directive, which we hope will be completed towards the end of the year. And that would provide what we have identified as gaps that would provide provisions for um, standardization of services um, and, and provide the, the different government uh, officials in, in the regions with the tools they need to properly regulate uh, services across the country. That sounds like a really exciting initiative. I'm looking forward to following the yeah. outcome of that. Yeah. Oh, that's great. So um, another thing that I wanted to ask you about, and, and there was a really, um, maybe I'll even read the quote um, that, that I was thinking about, but one of the things that your chapter highlights is sometimes a, a lack of alignment between an intent and then the actual impact of that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and if you don't mind, I'll just read, read one section that I thought was particularly good. So um, it said the government required NGOs to run programs to help orphaned and vulnerable children in Ethiopia if they wanted to facilitate intercountry adoption. The revenue generated through uh, intercountry adoption fees funded new orphanages, which then were filled with children who many times had one or two living parents. While the intentions were good, it also ensured that in our country adoption and institutionalization of Ethiopian children would remain the first option for children rather than the last resort. Um, mm. And I think I think there's a at least um, I just saw a recent article in Lancet that talked about this at a more global scale. This idea that um, that some of the intent to support and, and help children, re, the, end, the end impact is more um, institutionalization. So mm -hmm. yeah, when, when, you see, when you think about that idea, what do you see as some of the responsibilities of the NGOs, of people who volunteer, um, donate, uh, et cetera, um, especially when that funding is based outside of Ethiopia, you know, what do you see as the responsibility of those groups, individuals to stop the pro proliferation of institutions? Yeah, I, I can speak from the field side. Maybe Christy, you want to start with what is going on on the US side. And I think you sure. had a very good article last year on on, on it. Yeah, sure. Um, I think I think that quote really targets 
um, one of the unintended consequences of the extraordinary growth of intercountry adoption, not just in Ethiopia, but around the world. Um, it really has created a change in the way children are cared for in continents of Africa, also all over Asia, um, which have had these long-term effects of large numbers of children being institutionalized. We know from research that, you know, in, in a lot of the countries that um, we're working in, 80, 90% of children living in orphanages today have one or two living parents. Like there's, the children living in orphanages aren't orphans. So one of the things that I like to say is that when we, we talk about all the time, we talk about um, how there's, a, there's an orphan crisis worldwide and we have to get involved and we have to. And I don't think it's an orphan crisis. It's an orphanage crisis, right? Mm -hmm. Like there's too many orphanages. And I think that intercountry adoption helps serve that, help put more fuel on the fire. I don't think it's the only reason why it, the, the explosion of orphanages have happened. Um, it is part of it, but I do think that we do have a responsibility. We also know from research that a large number of the orphanages still being built today are being built and funded by the U.S. Uh, church. And so it's the church groups, I think, that also need to take responsibility to, to, say, to take a look and take a step back and say, hey, do we want these children growing up outside of, their, of, of family-based care? No, we don't. Why? Because we know from research it's not in their best interest. Children that grow up in institutions don't have the same outcomes and, and successes in life that, that children do that are raised um, in families. And so I think we need to really say enough is enough, right? Like I think over mm -hmm. the years as, as the evidence has been growing and building we've been kind of a little bit gentle about it. Like, oh, we, I, we didn't realize this. Oh, these numbers are growing. So I think that the, the, the Western church really needs to, to, to say, we're going to stop doing this. Um, NGOs as well, right? Like NGOs also need to say, okay, enough is enough, right? The USAID, the US government will not fund orphanages around the world. They stopped doing that years ago. And so I think we need to draw a line in the sand. It's time. Um, I think also in order for that to work, we're going to need to partner with governments around the world, right? So there's the, the funding coming in from churches and, and, and people with very good intentions, right? That very much want to help children that are orphans and vulnerable, right? Like I'm not saying um, that, that, that they're bad. I'm saying that, that they have really good intentions, but they're, it's, being, it's being misdirected. But I think the other piece that's missing is governments, and we're seeing this now starting around the world. Rwanda has done it, Cambodia has done it, Ethiopia is doing it, for governments to say, enough, we are not going to prioritize institutional care for the children in our country. We are going to pri prioritize community-based care, family-based care. And so it's gotta be that balance, right? It's got, we, we have to, as, as external NGOs and entities have to go in with a posture of partnership, right? Instead of saying, this is the way we're gonna do it, this is the best, this is the best way. No, let's partner with government. Let's partner with local NGOs and, and, and populations on the ground with the experts that really know what's possible in, in each country uh, and say, how can we do this better? How can, how can we make a change and, and start to change that trajectory of, of the numbers of children still going into orphanages today? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I, I think, especially when you look at it attached to international adoption, what, what I have seen on the field, and especially in, in communities where a large number of uh, children have, have left uh, the country uh, to be with a new family, people have started to see, have started to see inter-country adoption kind of as a form of social insurance. So they, they were really misconceptions around what, why those children are in the first place eligible for, for, for children. Some, some parents were given the wrong information that their children would uh, return after they turn 18 and that they would help them and they're just there temporarily. Um, and, and even the, the care in orphanages were kind of a little bit superior to the care that children received in their, um, with, you know, when they are with their biological children, which meant that you know, it was kind of a, a push factor for, for, for the families. I want a better life for my child. You know, if I can see my child in the nearby orphanage, why not? You know, if they can pay for his medical needs and educational needs, you know, I can often go and visit him or her 
and those were kind of the, the misconceptions around that, not having the long-term impact of institutionalization. And um, so with, with the funding with, came the proliferation of orphanages and with the defunding came, I would say, the more pro proliferation of family-based care. So you can see there's kind of really a direct correlation um, and so where the money goes really matters. Um, so uh, I echo what uh, Christy just said about funders and donors and, and churches being, um, you know, very thoughtful about where their money goes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, th I think that's such a helpful call because I don't necessarily think that um, 15 years ago, say, people realized this in the, in the U.S. as much, so... Yeah, good. So um, building on that a bit, you know, we talked about kids who are older, kids who have um, disabilities being maybe some of the harder kids to place. And, and so I'd love to hear, you know, within Ethiopia, as you're moving towards this deinstitutionalization, um, what are some options for those kids in particular? Yeah, so what, what we've been trying to do was really kind of build this program kind of from moving from the simple to the complex. Um, so children um, with specific needs that you've just mentioned are the kind of the, the group that we haven't been able to, to uh, address um, in the past uh, because most of our families, the families that we recruit um, are open for children with you know, much younger and, and, and healthier. Um, and as I have seen the trend with international adoption, when the options for healthier and younger children were kind of narrowing, then people started to be open for children that are currently available um, for, uh, for adoption. So I would expect the same trend to, to happen on, on the domestic adoption side, uh, but it requires more intentional effort from agencies like us, including government, to raise awareness about um, the needs of these children. Um, so what we're currently targeting is, you know, what is kind of the next challenge? You know, not really like a very huge, um, complex challenge that we're not able to meet, but something that is within our capacity to meet. So we are currently considering uh, children that are uh, living with HIV and, uh, and AIDS virus. So um, because we've seen some willingness because of what has happened with the awareness raising when it comes to HIV positive children, some families are open. We have had two adoptions so far uh, with that group. So we, we want to build on that. Uh, we are also currently considering children with minor um, medical needs. Um, and, and those would also be something that some parents are willing to consider, especially parents that have adopted before and have, have you know, um, they know the challenge of, you know, going through both the process and, and raising an adopted child. So that, that we're working with uh, uh, those families and trying to also tie it with a new variant of foster care, temporary foster care that we're trying to build. Mm -hmm. um, so if we can ask families who are open for, to temporarily care for um, such group of children and kind of build that relationship and kind of commit long term to them, then we can slowly move them as we have done with the foster to adult program. So um, it's it's a um, really a challenge not just Ethiopia but the rest of Africa that I have been to but I think something that is possible but that would take time to mm -hmm. oh, if I could just quick add to that I'm glad I'm glad that that Sabilu brought up trends it's been really really interesting watching Ethiopia develop their domestic adoption program um, because I'm seeing a lot of the same trends that the US struggled with the intercountry adoption 
play out in, in a domestic situation. So, what, but we're able to learn from the mistakes that we've made and the lessons learned. And so like the importance of post-placement and post-adoption support for families, mm -hmm. um, the, the importance of training families on how to talk to your child about being adopted and the importance of doing that very, very early on and, and not waiting for, you know, until they're 18 or some, some, some number. So those, those lessons that we've learned through inter-country adoption um, it's been nice to sort of be able to, through our program, kind of start to head that off a little bit. Um, but but we are seeing this, again, uh, this trend of the, the children that are harder to have, um, it's harder to be able to care for them. It's, it's they're, they're, They tend to be the last children in orphanages as we, as we de-institutionalize, right? And so um, as we work to, I love how some people put work from the simple to the complex. Um, so as we build on the lessons learned and we build on this, uh, this um, community that's more aware of adoption through the adoptions we've already done in Ethiopia, really to build, we're looking to build on those strengths. So we're looking right now um, to help implement different um, training modules. So if you're going to, if you're going to look to place children with, with disabilities or significant medical needs, you need to recruit differently. You need to train your, your potential foster families and adoptive families differently, and you need to support them differently. And so right now on the U.S. side, um, both Bethany, um, within the expertise we have just domestically, um, looking at treatment foster care, models of treatment foster care, looking at the work that we did um, towards the end of, um, especially in Ethiopia, where the end of the intercountry adoption process where the vast, vast majority of the children that Bethany was placing through intercountry adoption from Ethiopia were children that were older, had significant needs. And so how did we, we we're really looking right now at how did we recruit those families? Like what worked, what didn't work? And then taking that knowledge and then we'll, we'll launch that um, in, the, in the domestic arena in Ethiopia, hopefully coming soon. Also, the good news that I'm seeing too is another trend of we, Bethany's not the only agency looking at how to place children with disabilities into into local foster care and so we're having conversations with other organizations um, at looking at building shared training modules shared um, resources so that we're not starting from scratch we're not reinventing the wheel um, and we're and we're using the expertise of other organizations as well so that's been an exciting movement forward i think um, in placing children out of orphanages into families is that we're not, the, Bethany's not the only one doing this. And that, I think that's the only way that we're gonna get it done, right? Is that um, we all have to work together to do this. Mm -hmm. And it seems too that the partnerships that you're able to develop and the work across different countries who've experienced similar kinds of trends is really, like you said, valuable. You don't have to start from scratch. You, you mm -hmm. don't have to make the same mistakes necessarily if those partnerships are there. I, I really think it's one of the my aha moments of the last couple of years of working um, in the deinstitutionalization field is that um, we, we can't do it alone. We have to collaborate. We have to collaborate with other organizations. We have to collaborate with other governments. We have to collaborate with the local church, with the U.S. church. We're not going to be able to solve this problem if we try to, if everybody tries to do it on their own. And so the more collaboration and the more partnerships, um, the better. Sitting from your both of your vantage points, I wanted to kind of wrap up hearing from you both about, you know, if there's individuals, if there's churches, if there's other groups that are very committed to supporting vulnerable children globally, um, if we've already said, you know, hey, be thoughtful, um, you know, maybe think about avoiding the, that donation for new orphanages, you know, where would you have them direct their time, their energy, their resources, you know, from your vantage points, where, where should they direct those resources? Yes, so I, I also want to really mention that, you know, kind of with the traction that we've been able to, to build and, and the momentum that we have, I, I think we, we, we're working towards addressing critical gaps within the system, uh, which I also referred to earlier, you know, helping the government have clear policies and directives, and also helping government have um, build its social workforce, which is lacking um, in, in, in Ethiopia, and ensuring that we, we do, those social workers have the skills and the tools they need as they regulate and, and supervise and um, services and also help organizations like us 
um, implement. Um, so I, I would say it, it has to be seen both from the macro and in the micro um, standpoint. So supporters can really help, you know, in, in I have seen the US side of kind of, you know, services where it's matured over years and there is, you know, very strong workforce, but that's not the case in many, many African countries. So the, the support that can go towards helping the government and organizations like us build the capacity of the government and, and the social workforce is, is huge and it's really transformative. It's we've we've seen that firsthand in Ethiopia where because of our, what we've done in the past now there is this broader awareness in the community, the government, and and even a clear prioritization of family-based care and also very strong political will uh, from from the government. Um, so I think we, we anything that can reinforce that is is really helpful and, and helps the children um, not currently in need but also future children that will be in similar needs. Mm -hmm. Speaking of really specific programs that can benefit from from um, people's support, it I, I would say our first priorities need to be towards strengthening uh, biological uh, parents or families of origin. We want to make sure kids are raised within their family of origin and, and we need to do as much as possible uh, to make that happen. And, and we have really had a good success with that. And, and that's basically provide, pre preventing a crisis from happening. You know, domestic adoption or foster care is kind of a response to a crisis, but if we can prevent that crisis from happening, you know, it, it is in many ways, um, you know, reduces the amount of time, effort, and energy we put into addressing the crisis after it has happened. So um, we, ha we have seen a renewed focus from other organizations towards that, you know, for organizations that used to help uh, orphanages or um, even, you know, or, including governments that I would say without even referring to its own policies was unintentionally promoting institutional care. There's now that awareness uh, on which we can really build on. And, and so I would say, let's, let's help families. Let's keep our families together. Let's, mm -hmm. let's keep children in their families of origin. Yeah, that family preservation work is so valuable. Christy, anything you would add? I, I think he nailed it. Um, I think, yeah, I think focusing on prevention is key. I think being really intentional about where your money goes, doing the research. I've recommended people like, if you're thinking about donating to an organization, call them up, right? See who you can talk to, learn more about their programs. I love talking to people who are interested in what we're doing uh, in order to, to help them see the, the impact that we're providing. Um, so see see if they're open to that right see if someone will talk to you and if they don't then think about maybe finding an organization that that you can get involved with in a different way than donating to and or visiting an orphanage so be really intentional um and i think my the last point that i would like to make is um just really thinking about how long this process takes right we've been working on this this project this particular um idea of getting getting children into families and keeping them in their families for in Ethiopia it's been I, I want to say 12 years or so 13 14 years yeah. so it's not a quick there is no quick fix right and so what I would like to say to donors or potential donors is to be patient right this is a paradigm shift right this is a this is a, a different way of thinking about things um and so to to pick a great organization to support um, but then also be patient in that it's not going to be it's not going to change overnight um and so just realizing that being a part of like as supporting a, a project like this, you're, you're a part of the change, but it, it's, it's not always a very, a super fast process. Thank you both so much, uh, both for the chapter. I, it, it fits so well within the greater handbook and I think provides such a important perspective about um, how you can kind of weave together the on the ground direct work with the policy advocacy kind of macro level work. So yeah, thank you both for writing the chapter and being willing to talk about it here. 
Thanks for joining us at Adoption Roundtable. Please subscribe wherever you access your podcasts. We love to hear from you and have conversations about your reactions, questions, and experiences. We'd especially appreciate feedback if you have topics or questions that we could address in future episodes. You can find me on Facebook at helder.emily and at my website, emilyhelder.com. There you can sign up for my newsletter for the latest on adoption research and practice. Thanks for joining us.